Welcome back. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of American Muslim Project. I'm Asad Butt. American Muslim Project is a podcast where we talk about the people and stories shaping our collective experience. Today, we'll be talking to Qasem Rashid, a candidate for Congress in Illinois in the 11th Congressional District over there. Qasem is no stranger to politics, having run for office a few times before. He's also an author, a notable activist, and an attorney. He's actually been on the show before. We had him on a couple of years ago to talk about his children's book called Hana and the Ramadan Gift. I wanted him to rejoin American Muslim Project today to talk about what it's like for him running to be in Congress in the year 2024. Kasim, thanks for joining American Muslim Project. I think the first question is, how is the campaign going? Thanks for having me, Asad. It's going great. We're building incredible momentum. We're hitting our targets. We're knocking doors like crazy, having outstanding conversations. And it's just reaffirming my belief that a people-funded campaign that reaches the needs of working people in a meaningful and diverse and representative way is far more powerful than a corporate-funded attack ad driven campaign and and that's what we're betting on and that's what we hope will carry us across the finish line yeah i i think that your politics are very similar to my politics um uh, and and so that's why you know i love having you on to talk about it but maybe maybe a quick rundown on you know five or six key issues for you that you think the voters in your area are going to resonate with definitely well i'm i'm running for us congress in the 11th district of illinois this is basically the Collard County or the suburbs of Chicago, a pretty blue district. So the primary on March 19th is the determinative election. I will never say the general election is easy, uh, but I will say it will be easier than this primary election, which is, of course, very difficult in and of itself. And the main issues are what you would expect, right? Economic justice, climate yeah. justice, health care access, combating the opioid crisis, getting tuition costs under control. Um, protecting civil rights. And these are all issues that the incumbent has not just been apathetic on, but demonstrably destructive on. And as we make the contrast, we're seeing some amazing success stories. I was at a meet and greet last night and a gentleman, uh, an older gentleman around 80 years old, told me that he's a theoretical physicist and he's worked with my opponent, a, a former physicist for 20 years, and that I had no chance of earning his vote. The uh, event ended with him writing me a donation check and asking me to come to his home for a meet and greet. So wow. Encourage his friends to vote for that me. That is well. amazing. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Like just getting yeah. yourself out there and, that's and, it. and and making the appeal that you are the better candidate or the, the candidate for this moment. Right. Um, that's right. How, I, I noticed that you were posting on, on social that um, your, uh, your challengers don't show up to debates or one of them hasn't been coming or showing up and leaving early. What's that about? Yeah, the incumbent, a guy named Bill Foster, committed to three debates, then he backed out of all three of them. And then the one debate he showed up to so far, he skipped out midway and bounced like a bad check. And it's really, uh, I think, a testament to how problematic his record is. The bottom line is he wants voters to vote for a record that even he isn't willing to defend. Wow. And that's, there's just no two ways about it. And if you watch the first half of the debate where he was there, you could see him squirm and, uh, and get upset and get frustrated and not really answer the questions or answer any kind of coherent answer given the values of this district. And so our promise from day one has been to be transparent, to be accountable, to be unassailable. And I think our democracy is strengthened by showing up and letting voters scrutinize you 100%. He seemed to be taking a Donald Trump approach of let me just avoid debate altogether and hope that people vote for me based off of some mythology as opposed to the facts needed to protect our democracy. Yeah, I think for, I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's it's so anti-democratic to yeah. not show up to debates, to not engage, to not defend your record. And I think, you know, it's probably also a testament to your debating skills and your uh eloquence as well right like i feel like you do you do a great job speaking for yourself your views but also challenging people i see this on social quite a bit with your videos and your commentary and whatnot like you uh um point out all the uh, the hypocrisies and difference not only in your opponents but you know uh, sure. pe no, people I, across I, the world i appreciate the kind of words i said look i, I think it comes down to 
recognizing that none of us are perfect. I'm certainly far from it. Uh, and when you do speak, you speak from a place of conviction and knowledge and experience. And, and when you have those things backing up your statements, you can speak with a lot more confidence. Sure. And, and the other beautiful thing about that is that when you are wrong, you say, oh, okay, I have no problem admitting I'm wrong. Let's improve and do better. I think that integrity is something that people uh, value and cherish. It's something we don't see enough in politics. And um, anytime I can find ways to improve myself and be clear and transparent about that, I think that builds trust as well. Totally. How has ethnicity and religion showed up in this um, campaign for you? I, I think, you know, one of my favorite quotes by uh, one of my favorite sci-fi authors, Mary Robinette Cowell, she says that it's not diversity for the sake of diversity, it's representation for the sake of reality. And uh, a lot of what we're trying to accomplish is having meaningful representation in the halls of Congress. There's never been a Pakistani American elected to U.S. Congress in U.S. history. Yeah, We have um, a Democratic Party in Congress that is older than the average Republican in Congress. We are just as monolithic, nearly just as monolithic. There's more diversity among Democrats, I'll give them that, but not enough relative to the diversity of the Democratic Party. So, sure. you know, we're, we're, we're certainly not running as the Muslim candidate or the Pakistani candidate, but we are running on the importance of lived experiences of diversity. You know, I grew up low income. I grew up in Section 8 housing. I understand those economic struggles, those food struggles, those housing insecurity struggles. And I'm able to craft my responses and my policies to reflect the needs of working people, whether they're immigrants, whether they're people of color, whether they're low income. And, and that's exciting because connecting with folks on that personal level uh, shows that we're connecting not just from an identity politics standpoint, but from a meaningful lived experience standpoint. Yeah. And again, people value that. It's been an extraordinarily productive way for us to run our campaign. And uh, I think one of the reasons we're building momentum is because people see I'm not here as an ego boost, I'm here because these are issues I deeply care about. I've worked on them intimately. And now it's about transforming that advocacy for humanity into better policy to elevate humanity. Yeah. Do you, do you, do people question your loyalty by, uh, yeah, as a Muslim American? I feel like that happens a lot to candidates that run. You know, so far, it's actually been heartwarming, the amount of support. I've received. I, I put up a, a, a Instagram and TikTok video a couple of days ago because I am getting a whole bunch of emails and qu questions from people asking about my theological view on things. And mm. I had to put out a statement saying, <laughs> look, <laughs> I'm not running to be the imam of your mosque or the pastor of your church. Or the yeah. Of your God. The, the beauty of this country is separation of religion and state. And so whatever your religious moral standard is, I want to fight to make sure you can practice your religious moral standard. But doesn't mean you have to impose your religious moral standard 100%. on other people. Yeah, and, and so far, that's actually been a really productive way for, have this, for us to have this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not hiding the fact that I'm a practicing Muslim. My wife wears a headscarf, a hijab, and we're very public in our ads and everything about that. I, I think leaning into your identity, and being proud of it, and having it inform how you serve humanity is the way to go. And so far, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. That's, that, I mean, that's just uh, amazing to hear and, and, and certainly not what we're being you know, told uh, yeah. in, in the media, for sure. You are specifically not taking corporate money. Um, uh, uh, How has that been going? Is that a challenge for you? Or, or what's the, yeah, what is the reaction when you say that to people? It's both, it's both a challenge and a reward. It's a yeah. challenge because you know, our average donation is like 50 bucks. Wow, and my opponent's average donation is like seven hundred bucks. Oh my goodness! So yeah. for every for every one donation he gets, I need to get fourteen, uh, at least, just to break even. The reward is that it aligns with ethical values, moral values. It's what more than ninety five percent of Americans want, not just Democrats, yeah. but Americans. And I think it speaks to the trust and integrity that we're trying to build with our community. What I mean, community, I mean our voter base that for us, election reform is not just lip service, that, hey, I think we should get corporate money out of politics. It's leading by action. And the exciting thing is that while rejecting all corporate money, we have outraised Bill Foster, despite wow. the corporate money. Oh my goodness. Taken. Wow. That's great. We've had more than 12,000 donations wow. to our campaign. And it's a testament to the power of people working together. Because look at this. If, if I say... 
um, we need to get corporate money out of politics because it's corrupting. But then I take corporate money myself. What I'm effectively saying is it corrupts everyone else except, except me. for you, right? <laughs> it's a, I, it's yeah. just such a nonsensical. It's totally. Story. Yeah. And so I'm proud that we're leading by example. I'm proud that we're raising the resources that we need. I'm proud that we are paying our staff very well above market rate. We're paying our right. staff better than he's paying his staff a lot better. I'm proud of that fact. We're, we're hiring paid canvassers right now, starting at $20 an hour. It's amazing. And, uh, and, and it's a, again, it speaks to when I talk about economic justice, it's not just lip service that let somebody else figure it out. It's let me lead by example and show you that this model works. And so far, it's working really well. Uh, like I said, Kasim, I think of any political candidate out there that I've known, you align so much with my values as well. And so I really hope that uh, you are successful at the, um, it's on February, eh, sorry, February 8th is when early voting starts. March yes. 19th is the election. That's right. Um, what can our listeners do to support? Time, treasure, talent. If you have time to phone bank, uh, whether you live uh, here in the 11th district of Illinois or whether you live in Portland where you are, I said, or in LA or New York, if you can phone bank, we are phone banking every week. And we're not calling, you know, Republicans or mad guys. We're calling pretty strong Democrats who vote in primary elections and just letting them know that, hey, there's a candidate who's people funded, who you know, believes in economic, social, and climate justice. He's from the district. Let's get him elected. That's one. Uh, Treasury, if you can contribute, whether it's a dollar or the maximum of 3,300 or anything in between, uh, throw some coin our way because at the end of the day, every dollar we invest, every dollar we spend is a reflection of the future that we want to see. And then the talent aspect of it. If you are a social media maven and you want to put together content for us, uh, if you want to host a meet and greet at your place, if you want to host an online Zoom fundraiser, reach out to us, reach out to my uh, uh, contact at fastsimrashid.com and we will follow up with you. Any one of those things makes a massive difference and the more folks involved, the better. Amazing. Kasim Rashid, thank you so much for joining American Muslim Project. We, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Asad. Great to be here. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, a cool new expo being run by our friends at Mommying While Muslim. This is American Muslim Project. Welcome back to American Muslim Project. We're now focusing on some stories from FAN, our sister website that promotes Muslim arts and culture. And our first story is an event, actually. The Iman Entrepreneur Expo is the first of its kind event that's happening in the D.C. area that is designed specifically for the Muslim community. The event, which takes place on February 24th from 11 to 4 p.m., is a mix of shopping and social gathering and is aimed to uplift and empower female Muslim entrepreneurs. The event is being run by the team behind the Mommying While Muslim podcast, and we asked them on to tell us more about it. I would just love for one or both of you just briefly talk about what the event is all about. Okay, so um, Uzma and I, obviously, part of our platform has always been elevating, um, elevating the voices of underrepresented um, community. And in our case, it tends to be the, the Muslim, um, American Muslim women um, specifically. And that kind of is what got us started on this nonprofit journey because we recognized that there wasn't really anything out there um, to to help us. Mm. Um, she and I are both in a in a privileged position where we can sustain our podcasts and some of these other types of um, events that we like to do. We kind of did that, but we recognize that other people can't do that and their voices are being muted. That kind of is what was the, the background for um, elevating or the birth of Hawa. Isma will talk a little bit about that. But what I really wanted to do is have um, a two part and two part because we're busy moms. That's the truth of it. Right. So I'm like, what can we do in one day? Um, and how do we transform? So during the day, we're doing um, a vendor expo, which right. was my, reminded me so eloquently that she's like, I don't know what an expo is. So the other word is a bazaar. A bazaar. I know and, bazaar. Uh, a I bazaar. See, everybody knows bazaar, right? Yeah. I was like, bizarre. bizarre. Do you really want to use that? Exactly. Bizarre. Bizarre. Sorry, yeah. bizarre. <laughs> That's my boss. Bizarre with the me. two A's, bizarre. right? And so part of it, it was to um, highlight Muslim entrepreneurs um, pre-Ramadan, obviously, because yeah. um, that's a lot of the times where they get their most 
um, the, the most traction for a lot of their products and really put them in one curated, beautiful space awesome. so that it's not just a normal like your auntie's let's go get some desi um, clothing and do that. It was really more of a curated experience. That's kind of what we wanted to do because when you um, know better, you do better. And we really wanted to promote that. So that was during the day that we're going to be having that. We have amazing vendors coming in for that. And then of course, as all moms, as we try to like put thing, two things together, we're like, we're going to quickly change. And then we're going to transform this place in this amazing gala. Oh, um, wow. And by gala, it's uh, an opportunity for women to um, be dressed in their most empowered way. That's but right. really, it's uh, it's a showcase, a three dimensional showcase of all the things that are going on in this world. Obviously, as you know, um, even though um, we are a mom podcast, we don't just talk about yeah. potty training. We talk about a lot of the things that are going on in the world. And because this event is open up, um, opened to both Muslim and non-Muslim people, we really wanted to use this as an opportunity um, to start um, conversations that we might not otherwise have and fundraise for not only one organization, but two other Muslim-headed uh, um, nonprofits. Because our motto is always, you know, elevate and empower ourselves. And in doing so, you're pulling the person up behind yeah, you. Sure. So every year, our hopes, inshallah, but it, it's, it's our, our intention is to kind of open up the, the program to have people apply so to be the additional um, nonprofits. And in uplifting ourselves, we're uplifting that. And our hopes is then they do the work and then we do the work and then we're continuing doing the work together as a community. That's amazing. You mentioned the Hawa Collective. So what is Tell me about that. So the Hawa Collective is kind of um, something that was inspired at a conference that I went to. It was a podcasting conference and they were talking about indie podcasters and pod fave because when you don't have financial backing and you don't have um, control of your voice, you end up, you know, leaving the indie industry, which is the independent sure. industry of whatever art or media you're a part of and you join a network. And at that time, the networks were, you know, quickly realizing how powerful podcasts were and just eating them up, buying them up. You're yeah. signing a contract, but now guess what? You don't own your content anymore. And for us as women and as business owners, it's been really important to own our own work and to get paid fairly and treated fairly for our work. And that doesn't always happen to indie podcasters. Now, who does that put the most at risk? Those marginalized people, those people mm -hmm. who can't afford, you yeah. know, and the demographics of podcasts shows you who's listening and who's producing. Mm -hmm. And it is not people who look like me. It's not people who look like you. Um, and it's definitely not black and brown voices. So we wanted to make sure, you know, we could preserve that indie population of podcasters. And so it immediately, for some reason, I don't want, know why, I ended up texting Zabo right there because I started crying. And it just, the word Hawa came to me, which is our mother Eve. Um, because if you Eve theory is something I'm very dedicated to. People hear me talking about it until they're exhausted Amazing, and will yeah. turn me off. But what Eve theory is, is a biological um, suggestion that we can trace all of our DNA back to Eve. So my mom always said, you know, Islam honors women and mothers in particular, because like on the day of judgment, you'll be called by, you'll be known by your mother. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not what Islamic tradition says or is. But this to me is how I feel like God honors us is that we can trace ourselves back to our original mother. Sure, we probably can to our father too, but that um, history we think can take us back to Eve. And as far as genealogists know, it's like somewhere in the middle of Africa. So wherever she is, she has passed this on to us. She is also in some languages, her name is the air that uplifts you. And so while we say a rising tide lifts all ships, you know, if you blow on something, you're trying to elevate it. So this is kind of indie podcasters, women in independent um, media of any kind. We're going to be trying to, like when you make a fire, blow on it and make it get bigger and bigger. And that is our intention and our hope to help people stay in production and in business and keeping their voices out there is so critical. They just need the support to continue doing it. And that's why the establishment of Hawa Collective as a nonprofit was really, really important so that we could then qualify for grants and you know, awards and scholarships so that we can help um, not just monetize, but definitely support and uplift these up and coming podcasters. So this event is a is a brought to you by 
Hawa Collective and yes. Mami Mamas. It's kind of yes. introducing uh, Hawa Collective to the oh, community. Great. Like, hey, we're here. So all of you who have about doing a podcast room, maybe I <laughs> want to do a rip Maybe I want to. It's like, you know, enough of the maybes. You know, yeah. you do or you don't. I think that's a Yoda quote, right? Do or do not. There is no try. But even like before this recording, we were talking about how there's a lot of Muslim podcasters. And when we started back in 2018, you know, I lost count, but there was something like 63 female mm -hmm. Muslim females podcasting wow. or Muslim wow. female identifying podcasters. Sure. There are just a handful now that are of those that are still in production. Okay. And I think a lot of it is because you run out of resources and resources totally. don't just include money. They also include time. So oh, if we can sure. buy people more time, I think that would be... Um, one avenue of you know sustaining the longevity preventing pod pay, uh, pod pay. yeah amazing yeah well looking forward to the event can't wait to to hear how it went and see the pictures and all that kind of stuff and uh yeah we'll definitely be promoting it here at uh at uh Rafaelion. so thanks so much both of you Thank thanks for having so me. much and just a reminder, the Yemen Entrepreneur Expo takes place on February 24th from 11 to 4 p.m. We'll have links in the show notes on how to register. We'll be back after another short break. This is American Muslim Project. Welcome back to American Muslim Project. As you all know, we're in the middle of the award season right now, and it's great to see all the competition and the outfits and the awards and the glitz and the glamour. And while we are seeing the well-deserved nominations and wins of several Muslim artists and entertainers, there still seems to be a lack of recognition from Muslim actors at the Emmys. We asked Mariam Ahmed, an American Muslim Project contributor, to share her thoughts on why that is. While Muslims are still significantly underrepresented in the entertainment industry, some have managed to receive recognition at the highest levels, including at the Emmys. Though this recognition is long overdue, it still deserves to be celebrated. It took until 2016 for a Muslim to be recognized for their work by the Television Academy, 67 years after the Emmys were first awarded Aziz Ansari, a comedian and actor, was nominated and won twice for Outstanding Writing for a Comedy Series for a series, Master of None. The show, which is loosely based on Ansari's own experiences, follows Dave, a New York-based actor, who navigates life in the city while searching for his purpose. The show received a total of 12 nominations across primetime and creative arts Emmys. The first Muslim to win for an acting role was actor, director, and rapper Riz Ahmed, who has had an impressive career spanning multiple genres in television and in film. Ahmed was nominated for Outstanding Actor in 2017 for his role in The Night Of, where he played Nasser Khan, a Pakistani-American college student who was falsely accused of murder. Ahmad was the first Muslim and first actor of Asian descent to win the award. The other three Muslims to be nominated for acting awards are Rami Yusuf, actor, comedian, writer, and the creator of the show, Rami, Mahershala Ali, the first Muslim actor to be awarded an Oscar for his role as Juan in the film Moonlight, and Kumail Nanjiani, known for his role in HBO's Silicon Valley and his film The Big Shik. Rami Yusuf received two Emmy nominations in 2020 for Best Lead Actor and for Outstanding Directing in a Comedy Series. He did not win either award, but the show Rami was the first American Muslim sitcom to be nominated at the Emmy Awards. Mahershala Ali was nominated for an Emmy for his role in Rami as Sheikh Ali Malik and has won an Emmy for producing the HBO documentary film We Are the Dream, The Kids of the Oakland MLK Oratorical Fest. Kumail Nanjiani was nominated for Outstanding Leading Actor in a limited or anthology series or movie for his role as Selman, a.k.a. Steve Banerjee, in Welcome to Pitt Chippendales, a series based on the true story of an Indian immigrant who founded the male stripping company of the same name. Aside from Aziz Ansari, there's only one other Muslim who's been nominated at the Emmys for writing. Mackie Leeper, star of The Sex Lives of College Girls, was nominated for his work as a writer for the series Jury Duty which follows the inner workings of an American jury trial through the perspective of one juror, who is unaware that the rest of his fellow jurors are actually actors. In total, there are only six Muslims to be recognized in acting and writing roles in the primetime Emmy's 75-year history. All of these actors and writers are men, and three of them are of South Asian descent, which is not at all a reflection of the diversity of the Muslim community. 
which is the most diverse religious community in the world. According to a 2022 report from the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, only 1.1% of speaking characters on television are Muslim. Only 30% of the Muslim characters on television are women. Although the past few years have brought more Muslim women on screen in shows like Miss Marvel in 2022 and We Are Lady Parts in 2021, there still are significant gaps in representation of Muslims on screen, and especially in nominations for the Emmys themselves. Crucially, there are also very few Muslims who have the tools or the funding to create stories about people like them in the first place, in which they can center Muslims on screen without the usual stereotypes and tropes we're used to seeing in the past decade. Just recently, the Netflix show starring Abu Bakr Ali as the first Arab Muslim lead in a superhero genre series was canceled after it had already filmed eight episodes. Bad Girl, the DC movie that infamously became a tax write-off, was directed by two Muslim men. Muslim characters and stories are still not regarded as deserving of a chance in the spotlight. Stories that are about and for Muslims are rare, but the lack of recognition of talent in Muslim actors, and especially Muslim actresses, proves that the Emmys continue to gloss over the actual diversity in television in favor of upholding white actors and actresses as the standard. That was American Muslim Project contributor Maryam Ahmed, and you can read more of her work on our news and entertainment site for American Muslim creatives called Fawn. That's at createfawn.com. And that's going to do it for this episode of American Muslim Project. American Muslim Project is a production of Rafaleon Media. We'd love to know your thoughts. Please email us at info at rafaleon.com. Thanks to our guest, Qasem Rashid, and our friends at Mommying While Muslim. Thanks to producer Ari, and thanks to you.